Hello everyone, welcome back to another video about the Great Northern War. Sorry I haven't really been uploading the last couple of days, but today we're gonna be watching the Battle of Poltava, uh, 1709. Um, so yeah, if you haven't watched the other videos of this series, then go check them out first. And um, and um, of course go and check Kings and Generals, the original channels, they do great content. And of course, um, if you like the video, like and uh, you can like and subscribe if you want to. But anyway, let's begin. The Swedish victory at Fraustadt practically ended the Western theatre of the Great Northern War and left Charles XII free to return to the long-neglected Eastern Front. Peter, yet to earn his great moniker, came out wiser from his defeat at Narva. Emboldened by the gains which Russia had made in the last few years, and his new and reformed army, he awaited the arrival of his greatest rival. The clash of these era-defining individuals in the next few years would be the tipping point of the war, changing European politics for the coming centuries. We're not saying that Peter having better hair than Charles played a role in this war, but it couldn't have hurt, right? Here is the truth that can hurt. Two out of three guys will experience some kind of hair loss or... In the aftermath of defeating Polish Saxon forces and signing the Treaty of Altrenstadt in October, Charles did not leave Saxony immediately, instead choosing to settle down for winter. This was primarily done so the Swedish army could rest, following six years of nearly constant campaigning. It also... And Saxony is a very rich land and they... They didn't really blunder, but they they did kind of take some stuff here and there, and they were very fascinating to the locals. Um, the locals came and saw, saw what they were doing, that kind of thing. But yeah, I remember he had just won the victory at Fraustadt, which wasn't him, it was Reinskjold who did it. I think it was Reinskjold. But um, yeah, I think, I'm pretty sure Augustus was in Saxony by this point, meeting with his cousin, um, who was related, we were related through their grandfather, Frederick the Third of Denmark. But anyway, I'm pretty sure they met a, that he was there in Saxony meeting him and was very insulted by Charles. It was a very rude kind of man. He didn't wear a wig, for example. He didn't really do the, like, the posturing that was very common to the time. He wasn't really that noble, really, Charles the, Charles the, uh, tenth, uh, twelfth, sorry. But, um, but yeah, he did stay there for a couple of years, yes served the purpose of pressuring the Saxons into gathering the war indemnities as quickly as possible. The treaty itself was not immediately signed by Augustus, as he was still in Poland with Peter. The Tsar terrified Augustus, so much so that the elector of Saxony did not dare tell him of his... Am I wrong? I mean, I'm just going to look it up very quickly. Well, I checked it and, yeah, he was in Poland at the time he arrived, but by the... But he returned back to Saxony the 17th of December. So, um, yeah. 17, 17, uh, 1705, I'm pretty sure. So, yeah, the years passed and now we're in 1706. But, um, yeah. I, I was wrong about that. Sorry about that. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Um, yeah, fun fact. Marlboro. The, the victor in the, one of the main British commanders during the Spanish, um, war of succession, which is happening at this time. Remember that he met with him to ensure that you need to understand Sweden was a major power, just won all these victories. Marlborough wanted to make sure they didn't join the side, side on the, on the French. And basically they met, they didn't meet, make any agreement, Marlborough or Charles XII, but they did, but they did, um, uh, he did get an insurance that Charles would not interfere in the Spanish War of Succession, succession and he says, instead he would march towards Russia. Yeah. His unconditional surrender. It was only in the dead of winter, when Russian forces were retreating east, that Augustus could leave for Saxony. Peter was enraged after learning of the Saxon capitulation, because he knew that his position in Poland was hanging by a thread. The Russian army retreated across the Vistula and destroyed all of the bridges on the river, hoping to slow down the inevitable Swedish advance. Left without any proper allies, 
Peter tried to keep the Polish resistance against the Swedes alive by all means. The Polish resistance against the Swedes alive by all means. At first, he tried to bribe and threaten the Polish nobility into not acknowledging Stanisław as king. With Poland devastated by the civil war, the vast majority of the magnates refused to fight the Swedes even if they did not support Stanisław. Having failed to rally the magnates, Stanislav quickly became unpopular because he was viewed by many Polish nobles as just another puppet. So rather want they rather want August II because he was at the very least elected. Uh, um, yeah, instead of just forced upon them. Magnates to his side diplomatically, the Russians started brutally raiding the Polish and Lithuanian countryside, and they also besieged the important port of Gdansk. The siege was easily repelled, and military pressure proved to be impractical, as now Peter was just making more enemies. As a final desperate measure... I'm pretty sure you had actually helped, because when Charles XII marched through Poland, there was nothing left, because of the civil war, because of the Russians, because of that. So the second he was out of, he was on his way through, po through Poland, there wasn't really a lot to eat or... Uh, any materials left there, so we actually already here, the campaign already went badly. Measure ...to keep the war in the Commonwealth alive, the Tsar sent an envoy to Pope Clement XI. He promised to work on reuniting the Catholic and Orthodox churches if the Holy See denounced Stanisław as king. Whether his intentions were sincere or not is unknown, though the talks broke down quickly regardless. Without allies, and with the Russian army exhausted by war, Peter went to great lengths to make peace with Charles. He even offered to return all of the conquered lands except for St. Petersburg and the forts along the Neva. The ambitious Charles XII was confident in victory, however, and said to his commanders, Gentlemen, I have resolved never to make an unjust war, but to end a just one only with the utter ruin of my enemies. I will attack the first to take the field, conquer him, and then deal with the others. Hampered by the constant arrival of foreign diplomats, the slow arrival of reinforcements, and by Augustus himself, the Swedish forces only left Saxony in the autumn of 1707. At the end of the year, Charles crossed the Vistula with his army. Peter, who was celebrating Christmas in Moscow, left for Grodno immediately after hearing of the Swedish advance. He did not stay there for long, as the city was an easy target for the unified Swedish army. Incidentally, Charles entered the city three days after Peter left it. During his retreat to Vilnius, Peter ordered his Cossacks and Kalmyks to ravage the countryside and burn everything that the Swedish army could use. This strategy left the Swedish army with a chronic lack of supplies. Facing starvation, they took the last supplies that the peasants had, even further devastating the area. Meanwhile... So it's the classic Russian strategy. Retreat and burn everything. The... Uh, what do you call it? Scorch Earth tactic, right? Retreat, just burn everything. So the, so the enemy that is advancing against you don't have any supplies. And of course, it's a Russian tactic that they're gonna use in the Napoleonic Wars and the Second World War and so many other wars. Peter grew ill in early 1708, leaving all military affairs to his generals. Ill health struck him when he was facing the worst internal disorder of his reign, the Don Cossack Revolt led by Bulavin. News of Peter's failing health, as well as the revolt, made the Russian army fall into disorder. Men were deserting at an alarming rate, and morale was low. The generals were also bogged down in Mahilov, as they could not agree on whether the war should be continued with Sweden. Furthermore, 32,000 men also had to be detached from the main army in order to quell Bulavin's revolt. It was anyone's guess which way Charles would go from Grodno. So I'm pretty sure the Don Cass Cossack revolt, it was um, because the Cossacks didn't really like being under Russian sovereignty, so they tried to revolt against them. Yeah, and, I, and yeah, that was uh, very devastating. Into Livonia, or towards St. Petersburg, towards Moscow, or into Ukraine. At first, he left Grodno in a northeasterly direction. Petrified at the thought of losing his new capital, Peter ordered St. Petersburg to be additionally fortified. 
After forcing the city of Vilnius to resupply the army, Charles turned towards the southeast and encamped at Minsk. While there, General Lievenhaupt informed Charles that his army in Livonia was ready to march south and support the main army. In the following That's gonna become a big deal, Lievenhaupt and the supporting army. In weeks, some Swedish and Russian forces exchanged fire on the outskirts of the city. This incident made Charles aware of the poor state of the Russian army. Seeing this as a perfect opportunity, Charles decided to attack the Russians at Mahilov and then directly advance towards Moscow. The Tsar ordered his generals to hold the defensive line around Mahilov at all costs, as Moscow could be easily assaulted from there. Charles decisively defeated the disorganized Russian army at the Battle of Holovchin, however the majority of the soldiers and generals escaped unharmed to Smolensk. The bridges across the Dnieper were burned during the retreat. The Swedish soldiers were exhausted from the forced marching, food shortages and bad weather, so they could not build new bridges for a month. After so it is a very similar route Napoleon took against Vitebsk, Smolensk, the asthma. If you have ever re read about the Napoleonic campaign, you know that the Asma, for example, there is a battle there. Um, Smolensk, he almost captured some, a large portion of the army there in Ru the Russian army there. Yeah, they, this is sort of the same road he's taking, uh, Charles XII. Crossing the Dnieper, it became evident that the Russian forces had extensively employed scorched wait, earth wait, wait, tactics. Wait, wait. Yeah, I hear that word again. It became evident that the Russian force force marching, food shortages and bad weather, so they could not build new bridges for a month. After crossing the Dnieper, it became evident that the Russian forces had extensively employed scorched earth tactics. The British sure Dnieper is where Marshal Ney will cross, cross during, um, during his uh, journey out when he's abandoned by the by the French army, he will then, this is the Napoleonic Wars by the way, he will then march over it and reunite with um, um, the Napoleon's, uh, Napoleon's army uh, after they had abandoned. The area between Mahilov and Smolensk was completely devastated, with peasants fleeing with their cattle into the forests and leaving neither crops, tools nor any other kind of supplies for the Swedes. Additionally, the Russian army burned down almost all buildings, leaving no sturdy Seeing a direct advance towards Moscow as suicide, the Swedish command reviewed their possible options. As Charles refused to advance into Russia in the aftermath of the Battle of Nava, it came as a surprise to many that he chose to do so now. A variety of factors contributed to his decision. His belief that Ruthenia was a prosperous and resource-rich land, that the Ukrainians wanted to rebel against the Russians, and that he could exp- I'm, I'm sorry if I'm pausing a, a bit, a, bit of, a couple of times, but that's because I'm just looking up specific details, because there are certain things I don't exactly remember, and I want to make sure I don't say anything wrongly. So, um, yeah. Cossacks and Crimean Tatars. Meanwhile, a Polish army advanced into Ruthenia as well, the hetman of the Zaporozhian Cossacks, Ivan Mazepa, was worried at this confluence of several large armies into his lands. He asked Peter for military support. However, the Tsar refused, content to just shadow the Swedish army during its march. Mazepa saw this as a betrayal of a treaty between the Cossacks and Russia, and promptly allied with the Poles and the Swedes. The Russians retaliated quickly, seizing the Zaporozhian capital of Baturin, massacring all of its inhabitants and allegedly tying them to crosses and floating them down the Dnieper. The Russian army also continuously employed scorched earth tactics, depleting the land of anything useful. Trying to avoid further Russian reprisals, the Zaporozhians replaced Mazepa with a new hetman and continued fighting on the Russian side. The Swedish army, once again low on supplies, was eager for the arrival of the support army. Unfortunately for the Swedes, Levenhaupt's relief force was ambushed by a Russian army at Lesnaya in late October. Due to the number of casualties and not knowing the state of the Russian force, Levenhaupt decided to cross the Shosh River as quickly as possible. 
the army was forced to leave most of its supplies and artillery behind. The small force which did reach Charles was nowhere near as strong. And Peter called this battle, uh, the, what do you call it, the mother or the, the first Poltava, something like that. Uh, I think it was the mother to the Poltava. He claimed that if this battle hadn't happened, there would be no Poltava. Because then the reinforcement would have arrived on time and it would have been completely fine and that kind of thing. And thus it wouldn't have worked. Uh, it wouldn't, it would, uh, Portal would never have, 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 have happened. As he had hoped. Moreover, the winter of 1708 to 1709 was one of the coldest on record. This, together with the scorched earth tactics, left the Swedish army in a state. Thousands of soldiers starved to death or succumbed to disease, and many simply froze to death. The Russians suffered many casualties during winter as well, though nowhere near as many as the Swedes. So you need to think about the situation very quickly. You're, you're stuck in a land. There's no supplies. There's no supply, supplies to be found in the land. You're in one of the coldest winters in 500 years, like 1709, as you said, was like the small ice age or something. They, that was what they called, called it. And um, there are no crops. Um, the reason why they went down to Ukraine was because, first of all, they had Cossack, local Cossacks uh, support. Um, their support from the Cossacks. But there was also a lot of... It was considered better farmland, so we hoped they could get more supplies out of it. They couldn't. And there wasn't enough Cossack support. Um, so, um, yeah, and your reinforcements, Levenhaupt had, um, had come, the, the reinforcements, the Levenhaupt just had, have arrived with are battered by the battle at, uh, at the Battle of Lisna. As, like, there's not, they have been weakened severely, uh, forced to leave the artillery. They aren't as strong as he just would have hoped. You're in a hopeless scenario, basically. This is a terrible situation to be in. At the approach of spring, Charles was left with less than half of the men that he had started the campaign with. The great Cossack rebellion which he expected did not materialize. Masipa promised tens of thousands of soldiers for the upcoming battles against the Russians, yet the number that he could realistically muster was much smaller than that. Charles's last hope was Stanislav. The Polish and Swedish forces kept regular lines of communication during their advance into Ruthenia. Since correspondence between the two forces stopped during winter, Charles assumed that the weather simply bogged down his allies' army. The reality of the situation turned out to be far more disheartening. Stanisław's armies retreated into Poland to consolidate power, and due to a miscommunication between himself and his commanders, nobody informed Charles that he was left alone. In the end, it was one of his own envoys to the Ottoman Empire that informed the Swedish king of Stanislav's position. Unable to advance or retreat, Charles saw only one option for his army's survival. He needed to capture a well-provisioned fort and wait until support arrived. On the 1st of May 1709, the Swedish army besieged the port of Poltava, some 300 kilometers east of Kiev. The Swedes could have taken the fort easily by force, however Charles did not want to risk any unnecessary damage to the defences or the grain stores. Peter saw this moment as critical. He advanced towards Poltava from northern Ruthenia and ordered most of his senior generals to assemble there with their troops. By June 15th, the entire Russian army had arrived on the east bank of the Voskla River. Peter's primary objective was to cross the river with his army. To divert the attention of the Swedes, he sent some cavalry to feign a crossing south of Poltava. Charles then rode out of his camp to see what was happening. What occurred next was one of those minor chance events that sometimes decides the fate of nations. He got, he got shot in the foot. And now, yeah, there's of course that very, very famously he lay on a, like a board or, or like a, like some kind of border of some kind because he simply couldn't stand up anymore, but he still led the battle. The Swedish king was shot in the foot by a Cossack and refused to have the wound tended to until he nearly fell unconscious. To make matters worse, this took place on June 17th, his birthday. 
a bad omen which further demoralized the Swedish troops. While Charles was weakened by fever, his generals could not agree on the response against the Russians. Peter used this opportunity to cross the river and set up camp north of Poltava. The camp was fortified afterwards, and a series of redoubts were built. To the rear, the Russian position was protected by the river and marshland. There was no chance of the Swedes mounting any flanking maneuvers. The Swedish army numbered around 22,000 men, with a similar amount of cavalry and infantry. They also had around 30 guns, however the artillery was not used during the battle, since Charles anticipated a quick breakthrough. There were also around 3,000 of Mazepa's Cossacks and 1,000 Poles on the Swedish side. The Russian army had in total around 80,000 men, with over 30,000 infantry, around 20,000 horsemen, and 23 to 25,000 Cossacks and Kalmyks. The Russian is a horrible scenario. You can't outflank them. You can You don't have enough artillery, and he still expects a, play a breakthrough. Just as well, like holy, oh yeah. Russians also had over 100 guns. The numbers and the positions of the armies remind us of the Battle of Narva. Nevertheless, there are two important differences here. The Swedish army wasn't led by its best commander, and the Russian army had been transformed from a peasant mob into a credible fighting machine. There's that line again. We have learned, they have learned to be, they have been beaten so many times that they have learned how to beat them back. The Swedish War Council debated on whether they should use a cautious or aggressive plan of attack. The more senior commanders in the army preferred a steady offensive, while the younger ones proposed an all-out attack. In the end, the king chose to heed the advice to strike the iron while it's hot. Unable to take part in the battle himself, Charles devised a battle plan and entrusted it to Field Marshal Rienschild. What Charles did not know was that the field marshal was on bad terms with most of the other generals. On account of that, he failed to relay the plans properly to them, dealing a significant blow to the organization and cohesion of the army before the battle even started. Preparations for the battle started on the 9th of July 7th. The Swedes left 2,500 men to guard the baggage train and camp. 2,000 in front of Poltava to prevent a breakout, and another 1,500 to check the Cossacks and Kalmyks. A crucial part of Charles's plan was the element of surprise, so the army started preparing to attack at night. The lack of organization became evident here, as the cavalry took too long to form up and the summer night was quite short. By the time the Swedes were ready to attack, the Russians were already alert. At 4 a.m., General Rus started the Swedish offensive by trying to envelop the first frontal redoubts. The Swedes attacked relentlessly and took the first two, but they were unable to advance further. Russian artillery devastated the assaulting soldiers, and they did not have enough men left to attack the remaining redoubts. The Russian commanders still feared the Swedish troops, and asked Peter to send the infantry from his camp to aid the defenders at the redoubts. Peter decided to not make any unnecessary moves, since he knew that the Swedes were suffering heavy casualties and that it would only be a matter of time before they lost steam. While this was happening, Lovenhaupt and Rienschold drove back the main body of the Russian army behind the redoubts. However, they did not coordinate their attacks well enough and were split up. Charles, watching the battle... It's quite impressive that the Swedes, even after all this has happened, they're probably starving, they're probably uh, injured after the, the cold and they don't have enough supplies and all that, but they still manage to um, to envelop and um, take over some of the readouts. That does say something about the Swedish like fighting spirit and their professionalism. ...from afar ordered both Rus and Lovenhaupt to reconnect with the main body of the army outside of the Russian camp. Rus had lost most of his men already, and decided to retreat to a redoubt by the river, where he later surrendered. Lovenhaupt, after several hours of inconclusive fighting, led his 2,400 men through intense artillery fire to Rienschild's force. With what was left of the Swedish army united, 
they began advancing towards the main Russian force. It was at this point that Peter ordered the gates of the camp to be opened, and 30,000 of his infantry to array in battle lines. The cavalry subsequently formed up at the flanks. The Swedish commanders, seeing that the Russian line was significantly wider than their own, stretched the Karolians thin in an effort to avoid envelopment. I don't exactly remember how this battle will go, but I, you, this is a bad scenario. I think if you're spreading your lines thin, you can be, you may, you are vulnerable to cavalry attack, but on the other hand, they do have cavalry themselves. More cavalry than infantry at this point, I think. So, yeah, but it's a bad scenario. Like really, he's in, he's directly confronting them now with his entire army. While they were approaching the Russian army, Peter's artillery devastated the Swedish forces. Fearless in the face of death, the elite Swedish infantry approached until they could see the white in their enemy's eyes and unleashed several musket volleys. What was supposed to be their deadliest weapon came to be almost useless. The winter cold and bad weather in the last year reduced the quality of their gunpowder and most of the shots did not even reach the Russians. The Russian volleys, in contrast, killed many Swedes. Starving, exhausted and hopelessly outnumbered, the entire Swedish army charged. The few units which made it to the Russian lines fought bravely before being killed. Sources tell that only the company led by Count Torstensson, grandson of the famous Lenach Torstensson, managed to penetrate the... A 30-year war general for Torstensson. Torstensson. Scum. Yeah. It's good. ...Russian lines before being enveloped and massacred together with their leader. As the defeated Swedes retreated from the battlefield, the Russian cavalry pursued them and cut down many. Meanwhile, Charles, after having his bodyguards killed by a cannonball, gathered what was left of his army and retreated south. In the end, the Swedes lost around 7,000 men, with a further 2,700 captured, including Rienschold and other top commanders. The Russians had 1,300 men killed and another 3,300 injured. Terrible losses. This is a complete disaster for the Swedish. Constantly pursued by the Russian army under Menshikov, Charles sought refuge in the Ottoman Empire with 1,000 of his men. The rest of his army, in the hands of Lovenhaupt, surrendered to the Russians at Perivolochna three days after the battle. And he would never, Charles XII would never forgive Lovenhaupt for this. When Lovenhaupt had the chance to be returned home, he did, he wasn't. Every time he, Charles XII try, never tried to release him for pri from prison or anything like that, and I'm pretty sure he died in prison. Prison. I'm just gonna look that up very quickly. Uh, I've checked it. Yes, he did die in Russian captivity in seventeen in seventeen nineteen. Um, living uh, His wife requested the king to um, perhaps make a a. But back then, you would sometimes uh, switch prisoners. So if the army captured one prisoner who was valuable to the other army, they could perhaps trade prisoners and get essentially get some of their generals back or important politicians or something like that. But um Charles to have refused to do that. So um yeah living up he he died in prison. Um he uh, surrendered at Preo Volo Chinya. I think that's how you say Preo Volo Chinya. Chinya I don't know how you say it, but that's why it gets catipulated, catipulated, but, um, uh, yeah. And of course, um, not only that, but Reinskull, the man who won Frausta, he also got captured. So, um, yeah, many great generals died here, uh, got captured and died here. And this is a complete wipeout of many of the best officers and many of the best soldiers in the Swedish army. The captured commanders were kept as Peter's prisoners, while the soldiers that caused Peter so much trouble were settled in Siberia. For Sweden, the Battle of... Yeah, and they would become like a small community in Siberia. Some of them would return after the war. Um, but um, yeah, many of them would die there, others would live there, and some even converted to orthodoxy. I think one did, at least. So um, yeah, that's weird stories that happened there. Poltava was a catastrophic defeat. 
its elite continental army was annihilated, grievously reducing its defensive capabilities. Peter called his great victory at Poltava a divine miracle, as he finally managed to defeat the most formidable army in Europe. Russian armies would now be free to encroach into Poland and the Baltic without any resistance. Following nearly a decade of Swedish domination in the Great Northern War, Russia would now gain the upper hand. The war, however, was not over, and our next episode will come soon, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see it. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Yeah, that was really good, really good. Fascinating battle, like it's truly devastating how the Swedish army, which did so well for such a long time, suddenly got completely wiped out in this horrendous campaign. But um, yeah, it really tells uh, something about how the Russians have improved. But um, yeah, very good video. Of course, remember to check out the original video by Kings in General. Full credit to them. And um, yeah, if you liked the video, like and subscribe. And um, I'll see you guys next time. Bye.